And uh, I'd also like to thank the organizers for inviting me to present some of our work. Um, I have to apologize for these lines up there and down here. Uh, usually they're not there, but uh, just ignore them. <laughs> so I'm uh, going to talk to you about uh, coherent effects and spatial correlations in the excitation of interacting Wilberg atoms. Um, <coughs> our experiments are now moved from uh, Freiburg University to Heidelberg University and uh, the uh, current team working on the Wilberg project is presented here. Um, Christoph Hofmann, Georg Günther and Hannah Schemp are PhD students in our project. Nele Müller is a diploma student. Then there's myself and of course uh, the head of our group, Matthias Weidemüller. Um, I will also split my talk uh, into two parts. Uh, first give a short introduction and then start with uh, anti-blockade and spatial correlations uh, in, in the excitation of Rupert gases. And in the second part, I'll talk about population trapping in, in a so-called inverted scheme and explain to you in a little while what this means. Um, and as most of uh, my talk will be uh, about this first part, anti-blockade and spatial correlations, also, also the introduction um, will be about that. Um, let's start right away. Um, <coughs> um, if you speak about correlations in, in a gas, this means structure in a, in a, in a way. Um, and uh, we need structured uh, structure in Rydberg gases for many things. Um, we've already uh, seen a few in the previous talk. Um, for example, if you want to uh, study energy transfer um, between Rydberg atoms, uh, you usually need to know the distance between the atoms, or at least fix the distance of the atoms in some way. You can also think about doing quantum information with Rydberg atoms. We've heard about one proposal now which does not require uh, well-defined distances, but there are others which do. Um, and of course, you could think about uh, things like exotic molecules where you place atoms in, in uh, well-defined distances. So how do you produce structures? Um, one idea is to use separate optical traps. And we've also seen these two references before. Um, here in these experiments, uh, two separate optical traps were used to define the distance between uh, single Rydberg excitations. Uh, and it was al already possible to see uh, uh, blocking of the excitation um, uh, among these two. Another way to produce structure would, of course, be to use optical lattices. Um, and the most ideal version would, of course, be the Mart insulator. Um, first experiments on, on BEC have already been realized uh, by Tim and Pao. Um, so, um, of course, there's uh, a large step to go to the Mart insulator. Um, and then there's a third possibility of how to produce structure in a Rydberg gas, and that is um, uh, not, not to use something from the outside, like uh, optical dipole traps, to produce um, the structure, but use the Rydberg interactions themselves to create structure in the gas. And this is, going, uh, this is what I'm going to uh, talk about now. So we start from an unordered gas um, and influence the pair distribution uh, using the Rydberg interactions. The tools to do this um, are, of course, first of all, the well-known blockade of Rydberg excitation. And there have been many, many realizations until now um, to do this in experiments. So the blockade means that we inhibit Rydberg excitation in a certain range of distances. Um, <coughs> and uh, on the other hand, we have the so-called anti-blockade, which has been proposed recently. Um, which means we prefer the excitation at certain distances. And uh, by using both blockade and anti-blockade in a controlled way, we should be able to create spatial correlations in the gas. Fortunately, when we work with a magneto-optical trap, we, uh, we are just in the right regime to do this, because the typical distances are on the order of microns. And this corresponds to typical interaction energies on the order of tens of megahertz which is what we can usually easily uh, 
set as Rabi frequencies for the involved lasers. Typical experiment would look like this. We start with a magneto optically trapped cloud. And uh, in our case, we excite atoms in two steps. So we have one transition uh, going from the ground state to the intermediate state, and then another transition going to the Rydberg state, with two lasers usually coming from opposite sides. When the atoms are excited, we can detect Rydberg atoms by field ionization. So we have field plates uh, or grids uh, around uh, the magneto optical trap, apply an electric field, and detect the ions on an MCP detector. In reality, uh, this looks something like this. This is our vacuum chamber, and inside here, everything happens. Um, if you have a closer look, you can see a coil producing magnetic fields for the trap, and you can see these grids to uh, produce um, electric fields for field ionization. So let's come to the first experimental part of my talk, um, anti-blockade. Let's just uh, talk a little bit about uh, the anti-blockade proposed recently by, by Chinab Artis. Um, the idea here is that you, we have this two-step Rydberg excitation, and we use a strong coupling laser here to produce a splitting, and we use uh, a weaker laser up here um, if we set the detuning to zero, um, we can find the following. Um, if our atoms are arranged in a lattice, so this is the prerequisite here, if the atoms are uh, arranged in a lattice, then at some point, for some coupling strength, we get an enhanced excitation. In uh, this proposal, the coupling strength is tuned by tuning the principal quantum number, and you can see here that for specific quantum numbers, we get more excitation. And this is exactly the case when um, the interaction energy um, we have at the typical distance in the lattice um, matches the splitting induced by the Rabi frequency down here. So in this proposal, we tune the interaction strength by changing the principal quantum number. But of course, we could also tune um, the interaction strength by simply changing the distance between the atoms. And this brings me to, to anti-blockade in a random gas, because in a random gas, we already have all the possible distances among the atoms at the same time. So uh, we should be able to impose a structure in the excited atom distribution of such a sample because of the anti-blockade effect and blockade effect. <clears throat> the problem, of course, here is how to detect uh, which pair distances we have excited and which pair distances do not exist in the excited gas. Um, but fortunately, there's a tool to do this. Um, usually, um, for many Rydberg states, we have attractive van der Waals interaction. And this means that uh, after a while, the atoms get attracted towards each other and at some point collide. And uh, we can then record a penning ionization signal by simply counting the ions uh, being produced by collisions. And then, of course, uh, it depends on the initial distance of the atoms, how long this takes for the atoms to come together and collide. So if we do a time-dependent measurement, we can decide if we have closed pairs or um, a large separation in the cloud. Um, <clears throat> this has already been done um, and um, worked quite well. So um, for a sample with uh, larger distances among the Rydberg atoms, we have a long time until the collision, and for short distances, of course, a short time. Experiment would look like this. First excite Rydberg atoms out of the cloud. Then we wait for a given time, delta t, which can be varied. And then we ramp up the electric field. Any atoms that have already been colliding uh, um, within this time um, will be detected at the very beginning of the field ramp because there are already, already ions there to be, uh, to be uh, accelerated towards the detector. Uh, and any atoms that are still in the Rydberg state will be detected later when they field ionize. 
So let's see what we expect from such a system. So we start with this three-level system, um, three atomic states. And uh, we use a strong coupling down here. Um, and to see what interaction does, um, we now switch to a two-atom picture. So in a two-atom picture, we have these nine possible states, uh, starting with those atoms in the ground, one here, one there, and so on. Um, and if we look at the diagonal terms of uh, an interaction Hamiltonian, we find that all of these states do not contribute. Um, these states give uh, um, an energy of delta, the detuning to the Rydberg state, and only the state which contains both Rydberg atoms gives, uh, of course, a shift of two delta, and then an additional shift um, of the interaction energy of the two atoms. Yeah, already said, we should have a strong coupling here. Um, and if we now tune the laser, this delta over here, um, this is um, what we find, the eigenstates of the coupled system. Um, marked here are, of course, the two points where we um, expect uh, the well-known outer towns um, duplet. Um, and what you see here, they are lines with zero slope. These correspond to states containing, well, these uh, initial states. Um, if you have a slope of minus 1, and this means that it's a large contribution of these states. And a slope of minus 2, of course, means that the main contribution comes from the Rydberg state. Uh, and in this specific case, I have set the splitting omega 1 exactly equal to the interaction energy um, of the pair. And you can see here that uh, only at this point you have the uh, strong coupling to this RR state, but you don't have it here. So this is what we have to keep in mind for later. Um, yeah, we can now calculate uh, the excitation we expect. So um, we set all the experimental um, properties of, of uh, the pulse length and, uh, and the Rabi frequencies um, and uh, solve the optical block equation for this interacting system. And the blue line you see here is the Rydberg excitation you expect, of course, uh, an outer town splitting with uh, 100 megahertz in this case. And the dashed line here corresponds to the population of this state RR only. The blue line contains uh, contributions of, of any states with only one R, R, E, E, R, and so on. But uh, this red line is only the contribution of both atoms in the Rydberg state, uh, which means that um, if later on we want to calculate um, um, the penning ionization signal, it is this part, the red part, which contributes to a, to a collision, because here we have both of these atoms in the Rydberg state. Um, now I introduce an interaction energy, some interaction energy of 50 megahertz just now, and you see a blockade of the excitation. No? It's less than here. And uh, if we go to even higher interaction energies, now the interaction energy is exactly equal to the splitting. You see that there's still a blockade here, but on this side, we get additional excitation. And this is just because of this additional coupling to the RR state I showed you on the previous slide. Um, and you see here, the red line, we have uh, excitation of the RR state here. And this is just... Uh, <coughs> what is called the anti-blockade in the, in the lattice. Uh, only these calculations are only for two atoms. Um, to be exact, the anti-blockade proposed um, was at zero detuning. And uh, we also have a slight excitation at zero detuning. You can see this, it's hard to see, this uh, a dotted line here, which is just uh, 10, uh, uh, scaled with a factor of 10 to make it more visible. But there's some more excitation at zero here. Uh, and this is uh, what is proposed um, in the anti-blockade uh, paper. Um, but as you can also see, we get an even larger difference, an even larger effect if you go to the detuning plus or minus 50 megahertz. So of course, this calculation is only for a, a 
fixed pair distance. And of course, in our cloud, we have all the pair distance at the same time. So I have to do um, an average. Um, fortunately, we're dealing um, with only very small pair distances because um, at these high splittings, this corresponds to high interaction energies, and uh, only the nearest neighbors uh, need to be taken into account. So how to calculate the pending ionization signal we can measure. First of all, we calculate the excitation spectra for many pair distances, just as I showed you before. Um, then we perform a weighting of these uh, spectra with regard to the nearest neighbor distribution depending on how many pairs exist in the cloud at a specific distance. And then we add these up, um, at least up to um, a certain distance, which leads to the collision time we're looking at. So we add up from, from small distances to large distances uh, until a certain point, which corresponds to the uh, um, time delay we're looking at. And if we do that, we can get spectra like this. This is total Rydberg excitation up here. And this is the pending ionization signal we expect. So it's just adding up the RR terms. And you see here that even um, after short delay times, we already see collisions on this side, but not on this side. And uh, yeah, we get earlier and more ionization on this part of the spectrum. Um, and if you do the experiment and look what you see, you see the same thing here. This is the Rydberg excitation, the total Rydberg excitation, and this is the ionization signal from collisions we, we see in the experiment after certain delay times. <coughs> um, of course, you have uh, two contributions um, of, of the uh, 62D line we use here, 5 half and, and 3 half. Um, but uh, in the calculations, we concentrate only on, on uh, the larger one. You can do the same for another splitting of 150 megahertz, and you see the same thing. With one difference, um, this uh, asymmetry is, uh, is not as, uh, as uh, clearly visible as it is here for 100 megahertz. And this, uh, this is because at 150 megahertz, um, there are not as many atom pairs available in the cloud at the, at the given density we have in the magneto-optical trap. So there are more um, pairs at a distance corresponding to 100 megahertz compared to 150. And uh, <clears throat> if you now have a look at the pair distribution we expect from the calculations, um, you can see that at um, minus 50 megahertz here, we find um, a well-pronounced peak in the pair distance distribution at very short distances. These are the um, additionally excited atoms. Um, whereas um, we find a true blockade behavior at plus 50 megahertz. So here, um, the line uh, well, decreases at, at uh, short distance. The green line is just uh, the total um, nearest neighbor distribution we expect at our given density. So this should be um, a way to influence the pair distribution uh, in a controlled way. And uh, here, we should end up with a cloud containing preferably uh, well pairs at this specific distance. So a uh, brief summary of this first part. Um, we have seen that um, blockade and anti-blockade effects um, may be exploited to, uh, to uh, impose spatial correlations in an otherwise unordered gas. <clears throat> and we've also seen that um, we can detect these effects using the pending ionization signal, which is a very sensitive probe for small deviations in the pair distribution. Um, and we've also seen that uh, this rather simple two-atom model um, is sufficient to reproduce the data we measure. And I'll come to the second experimental part. 
um, which is about population trapping in a so-called inverted scheme. So um, the level scheme we usually talk about looks like this, again. Um, and uh, if you set these detunings to zero, you can uh, write down um, the, uh, a new set of, of eigenstates, which looks like this. Um, this is uh, so-called coupling and the non-coupling state. And uh, yeah, if you let the system evolve in time, then uh, after some time, um, population will be uh, uh, trapped in this non-coupling state because it doesn't couple to any of the other states. Um, this is um, the basic idea with dark states and uh, coherent population trapping and has already been used in Rydberg atoms um, in many experiments, um, some of which I, I have uh, shown here. We have seen uh, measurements of dephasing rates. We have, uh, um, as shown in the previous talk, um, seen quantum ba gates based on electro, uh, electromagnetically induced transparency. Um, <clears throat> and it's also possible to do very high resolution spectroscopy using uh, these dark state resonances. Now, the, the question we asked ourselves was, um, can we turn this system upside down? Um, because usually you start with population in the ground state, but you could also imagine a system where you start with population in the excited state. And this is possible because the Rydberg state um, lives for a very long time. <clears throat> and uh, the main difference of these two um, approaches would be that starting with excitation, the Rydberg state, you would always start with an already interacting system. Starting the ground state, you'd have to transfer atoms up to the Rydberg state in order to see interactions. But starting with an already interacting um, system, which you can then probe, uh, should be a different thing. So we did uh, experiments on that as well. Um, this is, again, the level scheme. It's a bit more advanced here because we uh, do optical pumping to the outermost states to really have these uh, only three levels. Um, <clears throat> and this is how we typically excite the atoms. We have one excitation laser, which is a broad beam illuminating the whole trap, and one which is very narrow. Um, <clears throat> and the timing would usually look like this. We do optical pumping first. Then um, we have an excitation step, which transfers some of the excitation to the excited states to start with. And then we have a probe, um, which can be detuned, which can be scanned over the resonance um, to, uh, to see uh, population trapping effects in the system. <clears throat> Then, of course, um, the problem with this uh, focused beam is that we have different Rabi frequencies everywhere in the cloud. So for the calculations, we always have to consider that we have to average over many different Rabi frequencies here um, yeah, induced by the, uh, the Gaussian intensity profile of the beam. Um, we've done measurements on that. First, in a non-interacting system, that is a system in a 30S state, we don't expect interactions. Um, in the first line here, um, you see um, a population trapping uh, peak in the middle. We always start with a certain population in the Rydberg level already. And this is the probe scan. So what you can see here, that is when we approach the resonance, we um, excite some of the population down. And then in the middle, um, we have one very narrow peak, um, which corresponds to um, a population trapping effect. Um, these two graphs are for different settings of the Rabi frequencies. And we have done the same experiment um, without this excitation pulse in the beginning. So we start from zero here. And you can see that um, for the higher Rabi frequency, we um, typically end up at the same um, population, these two um, experiments. So um, this uh, makes us confident that we uh, 
have more or less reached a steady state here. The black line is actually a calculation of the system, taking into account the Gaussian intensity distribution of the blue um, laser beam. And this seems to fit very well. Um, now, it becomes more difficult when we switch on excitation, uh, interactions between the atoms. And we can do that by simply going from 30s to a higher lying Rydberg state, like 61s. Um, in our experiments, we always use the, exactly the same Rabi frequency. So we change the, uh, the power of the laser beams to obtain the same Rabi frequencies, again, for the new system. And uh, <coughs> what you can see here is just uh, to check that we really have uh, uh, an interacting system and a non-interacting system. This is uh, just uh, a plot of the excitation blockade. Um, here we have changed the ground state density, and you see that the excitation of 30S states grows linear while uh, we have a saturation in the 61 state. So we really should have an interacting system here. So what do we expect? Um, I, I'm using here the same model I used before with the two atoms and uh, uh, optical block equations for the interacting system. Um, to simulate such a scan over the resonance. Of course, this is for a pair at fixed distance. And uh, what you can see here is, of course, we start with some population in the beginning. Um, we transfer the population down when we approach the resonance. And then we have this very narrow uh, peak here. Um, the interesting thing is that now we can see two peaks. One peak is exactly at zero detuning, and one is shifted. Um, and it's uh, easy to see what happens if you plot um, populations of, um, of the different contributions of these two body uh, states. Uh, the blue line is, of course, um, the total Rydberg population. And what you can see here on the dashed line, it's hard to see, the dashed line looks just like uh, a non-interacting system shifted by the interaction energy. And the dashed line is... Um, the uh, population of the RR state, so both atoms in the Rydberg state. So this just produces an offset to, uh, um, yeah, to this uh, scan. Um, and what's even harder to see is that we have a dotted line here. Um, and the dotted line goes like this. It uh, reproduces the large peak at zero. And the dotted line is the contribution of all the states con uh, containing only one Rydberg state. So for all these states, we do not have an interaction shift. So all these contribute to a peak at exactly zero, um, while the background is shifted. <coughs> now, uh, in the real system, of course, we don't have one pair at a fixed distance. We, uh, again, have to average over many pair distances. Um, so we expect this small peak to wash out, and this peak at zero to uh, remain there. And this is what we measure. Um, these are measurements at three different densities. Largest density is down here. For low density, just a symmetric scan, like in the case of no interaction. But uh, for a large density, <coughs> you can see here that uh, the background signal is shifted, <coughs> while we still have a peak at exactly zero detuning. Uh, the black lines here are unfortunately not calculations. They're just uh, um, fits of two Gaussians um, to, uh, to guide the eye a little bit here and to, to make, uh, make this a uh, little bit more visible um, so that we have a, a shift in the background here, but not on the peak. <coughs> this system is a bit difficult to, modi uh, to model because, um, well, in the system I showed you before, uh, the anti-blockade experiments, we had um, a special detection technique for closed pairs. So we, uh, it was sufficient to model the nearest neighbor interaction, only pair interaction. But in this case, um, we uh, detect the whole Rydberg population. So we have to take all pair distances into account. And it's not sufficient to only consider the nearest neighbors. We have to consider uh, many body interaction as well. So just averaging over these um, should not be sufficient for our system. Um, many body 
a many body model is needed and we're very happy uh, to have uh, Thomas Paul working with us and uh, we're very confident to have uh, a nicely working model in for these uh, measurements. Um, a mean field model, for example, would not work. A mean field model um, means that we have a, well, a system considered as a single atom um, and we introduce an energy shift which, uh, which corresponds to uh, the average interaction energy um, at a given Rydberg density while the Rydberg density itself is connected to the excited state population. Um, we have done such a calculation and uh, we get very strange uh, spectra out of it. Uh, but this is uh, because such a mean field um, ansatz would not allow uh, to see one peak at exactly zero and one shift at just less, uh, like I told you uh, before, because you always have an interaction term involved here. It's never zero. Okay, so um, short summary of my second part. Um, we've seen that uh, the long lifetime of the Rydberg states allows us to turn the system upside down and uh, we can see dark state resonances um, and we can also see that uh, the spectrum become, becomes asymmetric as we introduce interactions. Um, we've also seen that a mean field model cannot describe the system to atom model um, explains qualitatively what happens, but a many body model should be needed to really reproduce uh, what we measure here. What comes next? Of course, we have to restart experiments in Heidelberg. We're already working on that. Um, we have plans to uh, introduce higher densities, to see higher interaction strengths, and uh, this brings me back to the first part of my talk. We uh, would like to do some more structure in the system, so we're planning to set up uh, arrays of optical microtraps um, and maybe uh, in such a system can see energy transfer processes and so on. And most importantly, we have postdoc positions available. So uh, if you're interested, just uh, talk to us. Um, yeah, thanks for your attention. Could you go back to the um, EIT signals in the second part of your talk? The, this the measured one, yeah, ones. This one. Yeah, uh, yeah. So where you fit the Gaussians, I'm just yeah. wondering. So the, the Rydberg signal increase, I mean the background signal increases as you increase yes, the density. That, that's because we do not have uh, all the population in the Rydberg set before. It's just part of the population. So it's not a totally inverted system, it's a, it's a partly inverted system, but it's enough to see um, uh, this, this drop here and another increase. So you say from top to bottom, the Rydberg density, the initial Rydberg the density. Initial ground state also density. The ground state increasing. density is yeah. increasing, but also the initial Rydberg density yes, is increasing. Yes, yes. We can compare and that's the scales. Why the interactions here. play yeah. more and more role in your signal. Um, yeah, because we have uh, well higher densities, and this is why. And so I was just wondering right. about the pulse lengths and so on that you're using for preparation and for. for yeah, uh, these are quite long pulse lengths because we want to reach a steady state. So um, the, the the probe uh, beam has something like three microsecond pulse length. And the preparation, I mean um, the, the pump. Or the it's, a, it's a little bit shorter. I don't have a number in mind. It's about one microsecond. Um, and, a little and then bit if I look at the central peak, there is no blue shift in the central peak. No? That's right. There's no blue shift. No blue shift. Yeah. At least, uh, well, um, within our measurement errors, <laughs> we can tell it's zero. Yeah. So one of the effects of the interactions on the dark state is to mix in the intermediate state, the P state. So I was wondering, if, wouldn't you expect to see that effect in the data in some way in terms of the width of the yes. central dark resonance? Mm -hmm. um, Maybe yes, yeah. Um, so far we don't have much data to compare. Um, so um, within our experimental errors, we cannot find any differences in the, uh, uh, in the peak widths. But um, yeah, there should certainly be an effect on that. All scales are of the same order, so yeah. I think the scales here are like the states. What, six megahertz? Yeah. yeah. So this is um, way below the six megahertz. Yeah. 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 So if there are no further
further questions, let us thank Thomas again.